Good evening and welcome to evening prayer for Monday, September 21st. Today is the Feast of St. Matthew, Apostle and Evangelist. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. The joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun and we look to the evening light. We sing to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Praise to you, O Christ. O come, let us worship him. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way, kindle our hearts, and awaken hope among us, that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. For it is not an enemy who taunts me that I could bear it. It is not an adversary who deals insolently with me that I could hide from him. But it is you, a man, my equal my companion, my familiar friend. We used to take sweet counsel together. Within God's house we walked in the throng. Let death steal over them, let them go down to Sheol alive. For evil is their dwelling place and in their heart. But I call to God, and the Lord will save me. Evening and morning and at noon I utter my complaint and moan, and he hears my voice. He redeems my soul in safety from the battle that I wage, for many are arrayed against me. God will give ear and humble them, he who is enthroned from of old, because they do not change and do not fear God. Our New Testament reading tonight is from 1 Timothy chapter 4. Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and the teachings of demons, through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God in prayer. If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourselves for godliness, for while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, for to this end we toil and strive because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. Command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things. Immerse yourself in them, so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. And tonight, again, uh, today is the Feast of St. Matthew. And regarding St. Matthew, also known as Levi, identifies himself as a former tax collector, one who is therefore considered unclean, a public sinner, outcast from the Jews. Yet it was such a one as this whom the Lord Jesus called away from his occupation and wealth to become a disciple, Matthew 9, 9-13. Not only did Matthew become a disciple of Jesus, he was also called and sent as one of the Lord's twelve apostles, Matthew 10, 2-4. In time, he became the evangelist whose inspired record of the gospel was granted first place in the ordering of the New Testament. Among the four gospels, Matthew portrays Christ especially as the new and greater Moses, who graciously fulfills the law and the prophets, Matthew 5.17, and establishes a new covenant of salvation in and with his own blood, Matthew 26.27-28. 20, 
Matthew's Gospel is also well known and beloved for its record of the visit of the Magi, Matthew 2, 1 to 12, for the Sermon on the Mount, including the Beatitudes and the Our Father, Matthew chapters 5 through 7, and for the institution of holy baptism and the most explicit revelation of the Holy Trinity, Matthew 28, 16 to 20. Tradition is uncertain where his final field of labor was and whether Matthew died naturally or a martyr's death. In celebrating this festival, we therefore give thanks to God that he has mightily governed and protected his holy church through this man who was called and sent by Christ to serve the sheep of his pastures with the Holy Gospel. Continue with our Book of Concord reading. We are still in Article 5 of the Apology, beginning tonight in paragraph 209. And this was a continuation or completing this section called The Results of the Adversary's Teaching. Likewise, in Psalm 130, verse 3, he says that no one can endure God's judgment if God were to mark our sins. If you, O Lord, should mark our iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? Namely, flesh and righteousness of the flesh cannot endure God's judgment. Jonah 2.8 also says, Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. That is, all confidence is empty except confidence in mercy. Mercy delivers us. Our own merits, our own efforts do not. So Daniel also prays. For we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy, O Lord. Hear, O Lord, forgive. O Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake, O my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. Daniel 9, 18-19. So Daniel teaches us in praying to seize mercy, that is, to trust in God's mercy and not to trust in our own merits before God. We also wonder what our adversaries do in prayer if the ungodly people ever ask anything of God. If they declare that they are worthy because they have love and good works and ask for grace as a debt, they pray precisely like the Pharisee who says, I am not like other men, Luke 18, 11. He who prays for grace in this way does not rely upon God's mercy and treats Christ with disrespect. After all, he is our high priest who intercedes for us. So prayer relies upon God's mercy when we believe that we are heard for Christ's sake. He is our high priest, as he himself says, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. John 14, 13 to 14. Without this high priest, we cannot approach the Father. This is a new section heading, Salvation is by God's mercy. Here, Christ's declaration also applies. So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. Luke 17, 10. These words clearly declare that God saves by mercy and because of his promise, not that it is due because of the value of our works. But at this point, the adversaries play wonderfully with Christ's words. In the first place, they turn his words around and then turn them against us. Even more, they claim it can be said, if we have believed all things, say we are unprofitable servants. Then they add that works do not profit God, but works do profit us. See how the childish study of slick logic delights the adversaries? Although these foolish things do not deserve a response, we will still reply to them in a few words. The reversal of words is defective. In the first place, the adversaries are deceived regarding the term faith. If faith would signify historical knowledge that the wicked and the devils also possess, the adversaries would correctly argue that faith is unprofitable when they say, we have believed all things, say, we are unprofitable servants. But we are not speaking of historical knowledge, but of confidence in God's promise and mercy. This confidence in the promise confesses that we are unprofitable servants. Yes, this confession that our works are unworthy is the very voice of faith, as appears in this example of Daniel 9.18, which we cited. We do not pre present our pleas before you because of our righteousness. Faith saves because it takes hold of mercy, or the promise of grace, even though our works are unworthy. Understood this way, namely that our works are unworthy, the word reversal does not injure us. When you shall have believed all things, say, we are unprofitable servants. We teach the same as the entire church when we teach that we are saved by mercy. But if they mean to argue from these similar statements, when you have done all things, do not trust in your works. Also, when you have believed all things, do not trust in the divine promise. There is no connection. These statements are not alike. 
The causes and objects of confidence in the former statement are very different from those of the latter. In the former, confidence lies in our own works. In the latter, confidence lies in the divine promise. Christ, however, condemns confidence in our works. He does not condemn confidence in his promise. He does not wish us to lose hope of God's grace and mercy. He attacks our works as unworthy, but does not attack the promise that freely offers mercy. Here Ambrose says well, Grace is to be acknowledged, but nature must not be disregarded. We must trust in the promise of grace and not in our own nature. The adversaries act predictably and distort against faith the judgments that have been given on behalf of faith. We leave, however, these thorny points to the schools. The slick logic is plainly childish when they interpret unprofitable servant to mean that works are unprofitable to God but are profitable to us. Christ does speak about that prophet that makes God a debtor of grace to us, although it is out of place to discuss here about what is profitable or unprofitable. For unprofitable servants means insufficient, because no one fears God as much, loves God as much, and believes God as much as he should. Let us overlook these cold jokes of the adversaries. If they are ever brought to the light, level-headed people will easily decide what they should conclude. The adversaries have found a flaw in words that are very plain and clear, but everyone sees that confidence in our own works is condemned in this passage. Let us hold on to this confession of the Church. We are saved by mercy. Let no one think hope will be uncertain if we are to be saved by mercy. It will be unsure without something coming out first that distinguishes those who obtain salvation from those who do not. We must give such a person a satisfactory answer. For the scholastics, moved by this reason, seem to have invented the doctrine of wholly deserving merit. Thinking about such a thing can greatly exercise the human mind. We will therefore reply briefly. It is essential to believe that we are saved by mercy so that hope may be sure, so that there may be a resulting distinction between those who obtain salvation and those who do not. When this is expressed in this way without explanation, it seems foolish. For in civil courts and in human judgment, issues about rights or debts are certain, and mercy is uncertain. But the matter is different in God's judgment. Here, mercy has a clear and certain promise and command from God. The gospel is properly the command that directs us to believe that God is reconciled to us for Christ's sake. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. John 3.17 Whenever mercy is spoken of, faith in the promise must be added. This faith produces sure hope because it relies upon God's word and command. If hope would rely upon works, then it would be uncertain, because works cannot quiet the conscience as has been said before. Faith makes a distinction between those who obtain salvation and those who do not obtain it. Faith makes the distinction between the worthy and the unworthy, because eternal life has been promised to the justified. Faith justifies. And we'll leave it there for tonight and pick it up again tomorrow evening. We join together in the Apostles' Creed in the Lord's Prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. O Lord, merciful and holy Bridegroom, we grieve the fall of your church. It is our fault that the beauty of your bride is no longer recognized. Therefore we pray you, give and increase in us faith, love, and hope in you. Root out of us all sins and vice, all strife, all disbelief, all error and heresy. Rebuke the erring, convert the unbelievers. 
Bring the rebellious again to the unity of the Christian Church and show them the light of your truth. Protect our shepherd from all danger of body and soul. Bless all pastors and those who administer in the church and the building of your congregation. Grant them success in all things. Equip your whole church with the power and proof of the holy faith. Stand by your witnesses among the nations and further the course of your gospel in all the world. Fill all government with the fear of you and let their ruling serve to foster and preserve peace. Have mercy on our people and our country. Let the youth be brought up in discipline and in a right knowledge of you, so that they may recognize your law and the way of your salvation. Give constancy and loyalty to all pious teachers. Comfort all the troubled and sorrowful. Impart health of body and soul to the sick. Grant to all pregnant women, according to your mercy, a happy result in their childbearing. To the needy give bodily and spiritually, according to your good pleasure. Let those who travel be commended to the protection of your holy angels, and be a strong help to all who need you. For the sake of your holy wounds, O Jesus. Amen. O Son of God, our blessed Savior Jesus Christ, you called Matthew the tax collector to be an apostle and evangelist. Through his faithful and inspired witness, grant that we may also follow you, leaving behind all covetous desires and love of riches, where you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit one God, now and forever. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day, and I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, in all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good night.